Well, welcome everyone. Um, I'll pass it to Mary Hunt and then we'll go from there. Good morning, everybody. Uh, great to have you. And um, thanks to our sisters at Dignity who have put this um, together, our siblings, I should say, at Dignity who have put this um, program together this morning. And special thanks to Honor and Kathleen and to Mary Ann for the continued collaboration that makes this uh, a quarterly event that I think we all get something from and give something to. And uh, it's just a nice way to touch base with folks um, in the various quarters of the year. I'm welcoming you on behalf of WATER, the Women's Alliance for Theology, Ethics, and Ritual. And today's theme and speakers are, I think, at the heart of what we value, looking at our faith perspectives and our developing understandings of ourselves, both in terms of uh, religion and uh, sex and gender. And I want to just wish you from water best wishes for the fall. And um, we're already back at, back at the office for almost two weeks and hard at it after our lovely August break. But um, I didn't realize it gets so busy so fast. And I, I'm not sure if that's this year, but are you feeling that this year that, that it's gotten so busy so fast? Um, it's like with the elections and everything else, it's like the world is on steroids. So um, enjoy this respite, this hour together. And again, thanks to our friends at Dignity for the longtime collaboration that has made these such a, a rich and, uh, I think, fruitful experience for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I'm honored. Uh, I work with the Women of Dignity, part of Dignity USA. And uh, we love this. We love getting together like this, Mary. We like that we, it always looks forward to it in our calendar. And um, today's topic came from, um, you know, conversations over the years and and those different articles that were attached to the email. But don't worry if you didn't do your homework. There, there, there's no, uh, there's no, there's no punishment not to worry. Um, but we we thought we should see where we're at with queer women in the Catholic Church. Um, I think this was one of our first topics, Mary, way back when. And and I think it's it was an interesting article that you sent and I thought it was a way to um, kind of see where we're at and see how the world has changed and hasn't changed. So tonight we have, uh, this this morning, we have two people, two um, couples from the Women of Dignity who are going to speak to their experiences at, within the Catholic Church and the um, and other communities. So um, I'd like to introduce Sharon and Francis from um, San Antonio, Texas-ish. I know you really right outside that. And uh, <laughs> and um, and uh, longtime members of Dignity. And, and I think their story is very interesting. So take it away, Sharon. And Francis. <laughs> Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. I think the Lord is saying, keep an eye on me. I've got something for you. Don't be discouraged. Just watch, look out for my plan. I, as Honor said, I'm Sharon Gilstead, and peek just off the screen here is Francis, my spouse. Oops, the hand came in there. Okay. I'm a cradle Catholic. <clears throat> I got my parents got me to the baptismal fount as absolutely as fast as they could, like I was two weeks old. I grew up in a small town in northern Ohio, German town, and uh, went to college in western Ohio, Bowling Green State University, where I met this handsome, dynamic, charismatic army ROTC cadet always have a thing for uniforms. And we traveled, all of, we were assigned all over the United States, had four kids, lived in Germany, came back to uh, San Antonio, <clears throat> excuse me, and attended a small church uh, just outside of San Antonio. And after 22 years of marriage, we divorced. There was about 10 years in there. Oh, and it was annulled. I want to make sure you understand I'm a good Catholic girl. You know, we have to follow all these rules. And 
after about 10 years, I was asked to be on a retreat team called ACTS, which stands for, <clears throat> excuse me, Adoration, Community, Theology, and Service. And it just happened that Frances was the director. I'd never met her before. Somebody referred me over to her, said, this woman been on retreat teams and she's, you need her. So a friendship developed and we both continued to attend mass at this church. And on September 20th, 1997, we made a commitment to one another. And on this Thursday, this Friday, we will have our 27th anniversary. In 2000, I took a job with the Coast Guard. We went to LA and I then it took a lateral over to DC to work in the Coast Guard headquarters. And there we found Fort Belvoir Military Chapel and a priest there was a contractor who was also at a Catholic high school, very uh, progressive, dynamic. And what I learned to pass on was listen with an extra ear, look with an extra eye, and watch with your heart, because there are good progressive priests out there. And I'd never talked to a priest in confessional about my orientation or bisexuality or anything, but I started talking with him and he was extremely supportive. <clears throat> so from there back to San Antonio in 2011, our realtor 40 years was on the staff of St. Elizabeth Anseton Parish. And I said to her, what is that priest like there? And she said, his motto is, who am I to judge? But first, find the Catholic Church that you most fit with, and then we'll find a house. We landed at St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, <clears throat> the patron saint of, among other things, people rejected and persecuted for their faith, which is kind of ironic. We found a tough spiritual, social justice, Vatican II nun, and I mean this nun was on it. <clears throat> and the priest of the same cloth. She was the spiritual director for the Acts retreats. And one of the treats I worked on, one of the speakers, her first line was, I'm here to tell you, you cannot pray it out. You cannot fast it out. I am standing here as a lesbian. And this nun approved these the, all the talks that were ever given. <clears throat> and the assistant pastor at the time, came up to her after her speech and said, stay here, we need you and your gifts. Since then, this very spiritual and accepting priest, I decided I would talk with him. And I talked to him on various occasions, like, should we leave the church? I'm really angry with the church. Nope, don't go anywhere. Should we leave the church? We're getting married. Nope, don't go anywhere. Uh, I was asked to be on the Dignity USA board. I called him and he said, oh, I know what Dignity is. Don't go anywhere. Just go ahead and put your name in. So, however, in the last five years, our nun left to be prioress of the Benedictine Abbey near here. The assistant pastor was selected to uh, start another, to lead another church here in town. And just in the last two months, our very spiritual priest, who is now 71, had to retire. So the archbishop apparently didn't think we were Catholic enough. So he selected a priest who's about 60 years old, a convert from being a Baptist, raised in a Navy family, a very strict rule follower. <clears throat> and he's the archbishop at his uh, installation read this whole proclamation of what this priest is supposed to do, which, which was very evident. And the archbishop reiterated that he is to follow all the doctrines of the Catholic Church, and he had to sign this document in front of the whole parish. So now, important things are happening. We're going to get new statues in the front of the church. We've got a new chalice and a patent. We're going to have bells again and servers which is great liturgically, but this priest has no concept of spirituality. It's like, follow the rules. These are the rules. If you do that, they're, you're okay. So one of our good friends who's straight, married in the Catholic church, the whole thing, she was on Acts Core with me. She said, I've got to go talk to him. <clears throat> so she goes to talk to him and he says, she says, um, 
all are all welcome in this parish? Oh yeah, all are welcome. Well, what about lesbian and gay people? Well, you know, it's just like straight people that aren't married. They're all supposed to be celibate and then they'll be okay. Well, she didn't like that. So she said, well, what about married lesbian people, the like gay people? And he said, well, the church doesn't recognize civil marriage. Well, this gal is a retired Navy chief, so she's not gonna handle, gonna stay right there. So she goes to the chancellery. And the interesting comment was, all are welcome. We'll even bless same-sex couples. However, if any of them would commit anything that could be considered a scandal, you know how scandalous we all are. If we're committing a scandal, then something will have to happen and they'll be asked to leave. So today, this beautiful Vatican II church doesn't provide peace. We have never been out publicly. We haven't, I didn't put our marriage on Facebook like some of our friends have from the church because they felt protected. We are out in the Axe community. It was pretty obvious. It doesn't take a brain surgeon. If you all met us, we're, you know, it's pretty obvious we're a couple. Um, and I've been on Axe retreats and I've been on Axe core. I currently go to um, a nursing home weekly and take communion. But the, the priest was we were we just had a meeting with the community ministers and one of the ladies asked well what about blessing the children and he was really snapped you're not a priest you cannot bless children there at the communion rail so now thank god for dignity san antonio we have attended in the past but maybe maybe once a quarter because my eucharistic minister duties conflicted with when they had mass so now we're regrouping. I will continue with the ministries until otherwise asked not to, but mass attendance has to change. We're going to be attending dignity more often. And we have a mass that I usually serve at that we have friends that attend that are also accepting and encouraging. We need to pray. Some of our lesbian friends have now decided they can't go to mass anymore. They've actually left already. And this has only happened. He's only been there two months. Some are so distraught. Um, they just, you know, they can't even go to the church. So instead of just making us more Catholic liturgically, he is now chasing people out because of his rigidity and lack of spirituality. Now, I know I just said the priest before was do not judge. You know, who am I to judge? So I'm trying to make a judgment, not being judgmental, which is kind of a great thing here. So God save us. Maybe we can outlive this. He only stays at parishes two to four years. May we all have peace. Thank you, Sharon. I, it's We were always kind of envious that you had a, a welcoming parish and, and it's sad to see it go. So we will pray. We need to. Thank you. And thanks, Francis. Uh, now we're going to hear from uh, Donna and Mary Kay and not actually physically in Madison, Wisconsin, but from there. So please join in. Physically. <laughs> we are actually physically in Madison. One of us got COVID and we couldn't go away for the weekend, so we we stayed home. <laughs> we we're supposed to be in Dubuque, in case you all care. But anyway, so I'm going to start real quick. Um, and and Francis actually, not Francis, Sharon actually. Maybe I was getting her vibes this morning early. I thought how much the personality or the gifts or the welcomingness of the priest matter. So for years, um. In our when Mary Kay and I first got together, um, we went to parishes that we felt welcome in. And it really was the dynamics of the priests that did that. Um, and so when it's particularly Father Schumacher, um, in her home parish, it was welcoming and there were actually meetings with 
gay and lesbian people among the parish. And it was, it was really welcoming, but he retired as Sharon experienced, Sharon and Francis experienced. So the, it's within the Catholic church, it was possible at the time, you know, 30 years ago or so by now to feel welcome in a parish. And, um, but it had to do with the priest. And of course, you know, you've all heard our stories of our bishops over the years. And so we have our third um, conservative, very structured rule follower bishop. Um, but so we we searched and and thank God, you know, we were active in dignity at the time and mentioned to Jim Green that we were searching and this is where we've been to the, you know, to different parishes within the diocese and um, to Lutheran churches as well as UCC. And he said, well, go to St. Benedict Center. There's a very welcoming uh, mass there. Um, and that's where we've been for nearly 30 years. And at the time it was a, it was Catholic um, and we had a Catholic priest and some of you know uh, Ken Schmidt, who was a member of Dignity, a brilliant liturgist, I think. And it was very welcoming to all sorts of differences in our social norms. Um, but it was it was just welcoming from the very beginning. And over the years, you know, some of you know this story too, the Benedictine women of Madison have moved away from the Catholic Church. They got they were dispensed or whatever the word is, um, indulged from their vows. Uh, they just they dissolved holy St. Benedict Monastery. And it was recreated under the Benedictine Federation as Holy Wisdom Monastery. So it's now an ecumenical community. We have um, presiders are ordained ministry, whether they're married Catholics or Lutheran or Mennonite. Um, so it's an ecumenical community that they've worked really hard to create. And obviously we're very lucky and blessed to be able to be in a welcoming open community. And it's known as that kind of community in, the, in Madison. I mean, it's a known welcoming place. And we have lots of visitors who are looking for that. So, so that's my little summary of Benedict and um, welcoming and where we are today. And we've been, like I said, a member and liturgical ministers for 30 years. Okay, Mary Kay, Mary Kay has, she has a real, <laughs> she's got stuff written down. Here, so. Well, that's, Oh, and as my my alarm goes off, that we have this little meeting today. Um, so all of you kind of know me pretty well. I, I don't know, maybe one or two, but um, this may surprise you what I have to say. And so um, if it does, please feel free to reach out to me and we can talk it through. Uh, but yes, I was raised Catholic and every Sunday we would put on our Sunday go to meet and close pile in our nine-seater uh, station wagon and go to town for church. We lived about a, a mile outside of town. Uh, we would worship a guy called God or Jesus, and sometimes Mary. Um, we would kneel, sit, stand, make hand gestures, uh, like the sign of the cross, in hopes of being saved. We were sinners. And I can't tell you how many times I was told I was a sinner. During the holidays, we would uh, pray the rosary. We'd all grab a piece of furniture to kneel against in the living room of the old farmhouse, and we would pray to the bearded guy, bearded, long-haired guy in the frame picture on the wall. And I was pretty sure that um, we had a picture of that same bearded guy in every room of the house. Um, we were taught that uh, Catholic Church was um, the only religion that mattered. And uh, no, wait, uh, does that mean that other religions didn't have a bearded guy to pray to? I don't know. That didn't sound like it in my world. Um, we must all uh, be the best of all. Um, uh, oh, he was the best of all. So any other religion that had someone that they prayed to, he wasn't as good as Jesus. And I mean, Jesus could walk in water, he could part the seas, he could feed thousands of people with fish, with one loaf of bread, and 
And uh, he must be the greatest, you know, he must be. Um, so on came my world as I grew up. And uh, my father had a heart attack. And during that time, my aunt, the nun, Sister Irene, told me that I had to pray and I asked God for her to bring him home. And gosh, did I pray. For six weeks, I prayed my heart out all night, um, you know, all day, study hall. And um, the night before uh, his surgery was to be done, he died. But the interesting thing about that was, is that my brother Bob lived in Lexington. He was driving home. And um, when he got to the hospital, my dad said that he had seen the pearly gates. And he told Jesus that he wasn't ready to go until Bob came into town. And when Bob shared that with us, um, that was just an amazing story to us. And I, I truly believe that that, that happened. Um, and my, my dad died 20 minutes later. Um, and then a couple of years after that, uh, my grandmother got sick. And that same aunt and aunt, Sister Irene said, hey, you got to pray that God takes her home. And I'm like, what? You, you want me to pray that my grandmother dies? I, I, what kind of church are we going to? What kind of religion are we are we attaching ourselves to that that we want our parents and our grandparents to die? Um, so um, I stayed away from the Catholic Church for a while after that and didn't really believe in the bearded guy that I used to always pray to. Um, and then came along Donna, and uh, she uh, she had a very different journey of her Catholic church. Uh, she did a lot of, uh, she went to parochial school, um, you know, and learned a lot of book learning about religion. Mine was not book learning. Um, and let's see here. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead so that we don't take too much time. Oh my God. There's but, no. but I, I realized that um, as we grew along and started going to dignity and seeing a different way of thinking about religion, that my religion was more spiritual, that my needs were met more by the angels and the spirits in the world than going to a, a church and listening to a, a person recite some old book that I had never read or heard about or understood. or And so maybe, maybe my side of the Catholic church that I seeked for, for many years, um, isn't a Catholic church at all. Maybe I don't belong in the Catholic church. I feel like I'm, I'm beyond, and please don't take that wrong because I feel like I'm beyond the Catholic church. My spirituality comes through the energy of the angels and the spirit and the spirit world of the universe. It's much bigger than a little Catholic church. It's the universe. Um, fine example of this was my sister passed away on Labor Day. And last night when I was falling asleep, I had my hand kind of reached out and, and I actually felt her hand grab my hand. I know that sounds crazy and you can all start uh, a contribution for my, for my mental health therapy through Diane. Uh, but I felt her hand and I really felt that she was safe and that she was telling me, you know, that, sh that she loved me and that she would be near me. She'd be my, by my side. She would walk with me where I never felt in the Catholic church that anyone walked with me or was a part of me. All they wanted was my money and whatever else they could get out of me. Um, so at the end of the day, I'm going to choose the angels to be my religious, um, my religious um, go-to. I, I, I was never taught any book learning. I never read the Bible much. Um, I can't remember much of my CCD classes. I, I remember coloring in them, but not anything to do with God. Um, I did receive the sacraments, and I don't remember the days that I did that. Many people say, oh, I had a white dress on. And, you know, I don't I don't know if I ever did have a white dress. But I do remember the sacrament of marriage with Donna um, and and how that felt to have all my friends and family surround us with their love and their spirit. 
again, their spirit. We, we were married at Holy Wisdom, uh, ecumenical community. And um, I guess, I guess at the end of the day, I'm going to walk with the angels. So um, I don't pray much anymore, but I talk to the angels. And uh, so be it. That's the way I am. <laughs> so amen there. Amen, sister. What a, thank you. Thank you for your, your story. And, and, and uh, I, I think we can relate to both Sharon and Francis and Mary Kay and Donna, the, the, the journey. Um, um, we have a, a poem we were going to share, but in the interest of time, I'll just email it to everybody who was on tonight. It's a poem by, uh, that Marie found uh, by Jan Phillips called My Gratitude to Catholicism. So I'll, I'll get that to everybody who, who who's on today. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're all wonderful. I can't thank you enough for sharing as much as you did and and all your insights as as always.